Welcome to the Daily Horror Habit Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Krieger, bringing you daily reviews of currently streaming horror movies for your twisted pleasure. Be aware that these reviews may include mild spoilers. And as always, I hope you enjoy. Today's review is of the deep sea dread of Johannes Roberts' 47 Meters Down. Currently streaming on Netflix, 47 Meters Down focuses on sisters Kate and Lisa on vacation to Mexico, who decide to spice things up by cage diving with killer sharks. What begins as thrilling turns terrifying as their cage detaches from the boat, plummeting the cage trapped sisters 47 meters down to the ocean floor. As sharks stalk them, the sisters must devise a way to escape before their air tanks run out. And for today's review, I'm joined by a returning friend of the show, Bernie. How's it going, man? Going very well. How about yourself, buddy? Not too bad. Not too bad. I'm, I'm excited to kick off my first guest episode of uh, July with one of my favorite shark movies. So I was thrilled that you picked this. Yeah, you know, um, I figured that, uh, you know, the way that this year is going, we should kind of choose something symbolic for July and what better than 47 meters down. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so since we're both a fan of this movie and shark movies in general, what about 47 meters down kind of stands out amongst the other uh, crowds of shark movies that we get every year? You know, I you can you can talk about Johannes Roberts. Uh, you could talk about the supporting cast, which is wonderful, obviously, but <laughs> more really just stole the show here. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, this this movie has a, kind of a weird twist on the, the shark genre, right? Um, there's some certain homages in this movie to like, let's say Jaws, for instance, where at the beginning we're in there in the pool and you see like that undershot of, I forget if it was Mandy Moore, her sister in that. Uh, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. like you know scares her she drops like the red wine glass into the water there's that red uh, you know hue basically in the pool water so it, yeah you know obviously alluding to some kind of you know attack in that sense or some coming forthcoming attack um but i just i love the the different take on this genre that that 47 meters down brings because i don't think we really have gotten this kind of a, a take in that kind of a genre before. Yeah, I mean, that's the big thing is that the thing that differentiates this from the other shark movies is that it's about people that are literally trapped on the ocean floor, whereas we've had movies before where people are trapped in the water, like they're out in the middle of the ocean or something, their boat's broken down or they got left behind, and then sharks show up. But in this, it adds this extra component and really an extra layer of like tension that I think Johannes really capitalizes on in the idea that the sisters are trapped in that cage for a portion of the movie. And then once they're able to get free, it's not really like once you get free, all of a sudden, like the movie's over because that's like the beginning of it in terms of their struggle for trying to get back to the boat that uh, they probably regret booking a trip on. Yeah. I mean, in retrospect, they probably should have stayed at that pool and gotten some more wine. Uh, yeah. But, I mean, you know, for us, I think, You know, again, we've seen most of these shark films, and I think you hit it, where they're on at the top of the water at the surface, right? And Mm -hmm. worrying about, like, seeing the shark's fin, for instance, and then you hear that kind of R, you know, Jaws music in the background. This has... I'm just, I'm mortified of dark water in general. Um, I never like to swim in any kind of body of water at night, um, let alone take showers at night, just, you know, to... (laughs) Um, but that, you know, seeing them, um, and we, you know, I don't want to jump too far ahead here, but seeing them when they're at the bottom of the, the ocean there and they get out and they're trying to look around for their friend at one point and you see just like a distant beam of light, you know, however long, far away that is, that's everything that I hate about the ocean. And like Johannes did a perfect job of kind of exemplifying that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's, like the easy sell for this movie, if you were to pitch it to somebody is, yeah, it's another shark attack movie, but that's not really doing it justice because I think the sharks almost become secondary in terms of the scares for me, at least. And it sounds like for you too, in that Johannes really knows how to like weaponize our collective fear of being in the deep sea. It's not these people like, Oh, I have to tread water. It's like, no, breathing is not an issue. You have a tank until obviously it's going to run out, but it's this idea that you can become lost in the ocean. And in fact, we see instances where the ocean, you can only see so many feet in front of you before it might as well be pitch black in terms of 
when they're in the cage originally and they're taking pictures with the camera and they drop it, one of the sharks just comes out of the the ocean at them. And it's like, it's, he might as well be lunging from the shadows. It's the same idea of this infinite darkness that you can only see a couple feet in front of you and some, and whatever's going to kill you could just be right there. Right. I mean, I, you know, the cinematography in this is phenomenal. Um, getting the shots of like, you know, um, Mandy Moore's character, Lisa, or her sister, Kate, when they're, you know, kind of swimming away in that sense. And you're right there with them in terms of fear. Um, Cause you can see obviously the fear in their eyes, but then it'll, you know, kind of glance back out into that, you know, never ending kind of sea of darkness out there. Um, mm-hmm. So I just, I think they did a really good job of kind of encapsulating that fear and portraying it in a way that it's going to really resonate for a lot of folks out there. Yeah. And I mean, from the very opening moments of the movie where it follows up to the scene that you mentioned where they're in the pool and we have that brief moment of foreshadowing where the wine or the margarita or whatever spills and it looks like blood in the water essentially. Mm -hmm. But before that, it just is the soundtrack playing and then it's just a shot of the ocean floor. And it's kind of starting at the very bottom of the ocean floor or rather 47 meters down and then it's pulling away slowly. And it just really captures that sense of tension that you're going to be spending a lot of time here. And just because you can't see a shark right now doesn't detract from the fact that this is like the most terrifying place in the world. Right. Uh, You know, I think the way that the movie progresses, um, giving us that first shot. So we have an idea of like, okay, this is kind of the scenario that we're dealing with outside of, you know, the name and any trailers that we've seen. Um, the story picks up and, you know, maybe, I don't know if you have a similar thought feeling on this, but I thought the first 20 minutes didn't necessarily need to be in that movie. They could have covered that in like literally five and a half minutes and we could have just jumped right into, you know, for lack of a better term, just the, the water in that sense. Um, yeah. So like, what were your thoughts on that? Did it develop slowly for you or did it kind of adequately do that job for you? to Like, I, I understand the purpose of it, right? Like, you have to be investing in these characters to care, but it's just so forgettable and so kind of awkwardly cliched, this idea that like her boyfriend dumped her because she's not adventurous and somehow she's going to get back at him or win him back by proving she's adventurous by going cage diving with sharks. And it's just, it doesn't, I'm, I don't care about it because it's so cheesy and so corny that I'm just like, I just want them to get in the water. So every minute that, happens after that where they're not in the water i'm just like all right wrap it up wrap it up wrap it up wrap it up get in the water get in the water like you said um and yeah it's just like painfully awkward too because it's uh mandy moore like pining for this guy who she said that he broke up with her and then he texts her and he's like i got all this stuff out of the apartment and she's like oh i wish you were here with us or something like that and it's just like didn't he just break up with you like why are you sending him xo after like saying that, I don't know, that whole segment is weird. And then they get shit faced and then they finally get in the water. But did any of that stuff track with you? No, I mean, like this is, this is maybe a really silly take, but I, I just kind of felt for those two guys that were like dancing with those sisters who were like <laughs> fun night. And then at the end, it's literally them just like spinning in a circle at the you know at the beach going my life is amazing and they're both just laying in the beach i was like i've been there brother i feel your pain <laughs> <laughs> so yeah I mean, outside of that kind of stuff i mean obviously they're trying to do some sort of character development i i don't necessarily think that there was you know that much needed or necessary for that to to work right. but you know giving us that backstory we understand in theory, why um, Lisa and Kate, uh, Mandy Moore and Claire Holt are there. Um, And then it gives a little bit more of a background, I guess, of like why she's trying to be adventurous, which again, I, I don't necessarily agree with, but you know, the, the point of the story origin is kind of there, but once we get there, I mean, like, when did you start to realize that this was kind of not, wasn't going to go the way that it was seeming? Was it as soon as like the rope broke or did you see any kind of foreshadowing before that? I mean, the foreshadowing from the beginning where the drink falls in the water, like it's pretty clear. This is like an ominous beginning and it's not even just that again, it's kind of this atmosphere, the way that he presents the ocean, it's already threatening in that opening scene of just the camera pulling back of the, uh, and showing us the ocean. 
and there's nothing there. It's just rocks in the ocean floor, but it is very threatening and very ominous. So as soon as the cage drops and the guy on the radio is just like, oh yeah, it just slipped. I was just like, nah, that pulling the eject cord on this, like nothing just slips like that. Like, and then have an underwater, like tower of terror ride 47 feet down. Like I'm just not about that. So as soon as something slips, Mm -hmm. you're just, you're yanking me right out of the water. And I don't understand why this is a stupid nitpicky thing, but why the hatch on top of the cage has to be closed. I think like a shark can't fit in that. No, but I think it's for the, the, like, imagine if for some reason that hatch is open, right? And that happens in real life where, you know, there's some sort of malfunction with that rope or the um, whatever's kind of holding them up, right? Um, Mm -hmm. If they fall kind of deeper in and they're trying to get out, that might be a problem. I just mean like, why is it there? It's They could have just not had a hatch. Well, no, but like, I mean, you see it down when they fall down and uh, like when they hit the, the ocean floor, the, that sea floor there, um, and there's a shark. I mean, it's obviously that's not realistic that a, a shark would be able to bend metal to that extent. Um, but I think they want to avoid any kind of scenarios to. to I'm, see, I'm doing I'm doing the thing that I fucking hate when people do. I'm nitpicking the movie for and just need to roll with it. And but so, what part for you was the most tense? I think before we even get to kind of like the specifics of how the plot evolves in the second half of the movie. What was the moment that kind of stood out to you early on? I mean, well, first off, um, you know, the first kind of step to realizing you're wrong or or being wrong is admitting it. Right. So I appreciate you mentioning that. No problem. (laughs) It's part of the program. Um, but the, the scene for me was probably, I, I kind of alluded to earlier when, um, when her sister is like losing oxygen and they're, and Mandy Moore has to, you know, go out basically and try and reach, uh, I forget if it was Javier or Luis that, that went Mm -hmm. originally with that flashlight, but that, and then you see it move like in some sort of like a, I don't know, it moved laterally. Um, it was a pretty substantial amount and then it just stops. And, Again, I think to us, we're thinking automatically a shark because we've encountered so many at that point, right? But to them, they have no idea. They might just be thinking, okay, these are professional divers. They're just trying to find us, right? Um, but when there's like a moment basically where she reaches like uh, the, the like shelf basically of that like area that they're sitting on, right? Um, and you, can, you can't see the bottom, and you don't know how far you have to kind of yep. cross to get to where that light is. I I wanted to die, and I'm you know pretty high above <laughs> sea. Yeah. Uh, so I, I that that entire scene like mortified me. I that's one of my nightmares in general. Um, so I think again the cinematography for that and the way that Mandy Moore acted it, uh, I think it, it was just a plus all around. Yeah, I mean, that scene, I think this is the third time I've seen this movie. That scene makes me shit myself every single time I see it. The part where they assume, and I even referred to it earlier, as the ocean floor. But 47 meters down is nothing in terms of like the ocean and the vastness and the emptiness of the ocean. So when she gets to the edge of that cliff and looks down and just sees nothing, like that is my pure, like literally I get have a, it's like you're, uh, going over a hill on a roller coaster or a big bend or whatever. And then there's a drop and your stomach just drops. Like that hits me every single time when it's just this idea that if I stop f- kicking my legs or flapping my arms or whatever, treading water, I'm just going to sink forever until this air tank runs out. Like that's such a terrifying idea. And the fact that Johannes even builds off of the, that idea of the emptiness when she finally gets the light But then she's like looking for the shark and she starts spinning around in circles and she loses track of where she is. Like the way that he's able to escalate tension to keep kind of like shattering the ceiling of tension. And you always assume like, oh, it can't get any more tense than that. And then he just builds on it. That's something about this movie that I don't think gets nearly enough credit where a lot of people 
like I did a few minutes ago where you're kind of like nitpicking stupid little things or like the characters aren't that great or whatever. His ability to make tension out of elements of deep sea movies or shark movies that not a lot of directors do for whatever reason or aren't able to capitalize on as well. It's just such a remarkable trait of this movie that I don't think gets enough credit. Yeah, and I mean, there's there's very few movies where I think everybody collectively will like audibly say something. Um, there, that was one of those mo- moments, especially when she's kind of circling around on that little kind of rock in the middle of nowhere, basically, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I mean, I literally, I had my hands on my head and I was saying, yeah. oh God, oh God. Like it, those are kind of the moments and that's, I think, what accentuates or, or exemplifies movies, especially in this kind of a genre where you can have that sort of kind of a, a, a fan reaction or a viewing reaction to it. Um, mm-hmm. Even though, again, you know, I've seen this two or three times now too, that that moment always gets me. But even that point when she kind of is swimming back and you can see like the sweat on her forehead and like the fear in her eyes and she's like trembling, you know, kind of calling out to her sister and mm-hmm. runs into another one of the divers who says, get out. And he can't even finish that sentence before a shark gets him. It again, I think you, you hit it on the head where the, t- the suspense is always building on itself. And even again, when you think you hit a crescendo, all of a sudden she's, you know, trying to help her sister out and then her sister ends up getting killed. Um, like it's just, this movie has so many of those moments where again, I, you know, I'm anywhere from between like screaming at the TV, not to, <laughs> and also like, you know, curling up and throwing a blanket over myself. Mm-hmm. So it's like, there were just so many of those moments that I loved in this movie to, to make it that great. Yeah, for me, another moment that comes before that, I think, is when um, Claire Hoyt's character, Holt's character, Kate, um, she wants to get out of the cage initially, but they can't because there's uh, the winch basically fell on top of the cage and she can't move it. And so the only way that she can climb out of the cage is if she takes her mask off underwater. And that, again, is one of those scenes where, seeing this like three times, I hold my breath the entire time she's holding her breath because it's just he's weaponized my worst nightmare. This idea that, Oh, I can, I'm fine. I've got a tank. I can breathe. If I want to live though, I have to take that mask off. And if I don't get that on, or if I don't take a big enough breath, I'm going to fucking drown. Like it's, he taps into my, such a primal fear that I have, which I mean, I don't go deep sea diving or anything. So it's an irrational fear, but his ability to kind of weaponize this fear of mine that, I just I don't I never think about things like this in Jaws or uh, Deep Blue Sea or The Meg or whatever all these other shark movies. It's more an emphasis on like avoiding the shark, mm-hmm. whereas in this movie it really is the ocean is this ever evolving threat in a way that it's not sinister. It's just the reality of what the ocean is right. and his ability to kind of take that and make that scarier in some instances than the sharks themselves is really great because then we have the second half of the movie, which is much more shark oriented, be, like you never get tired of them, basically. Right. Well, because again, he always has like another sprinkle or another kind of a pivot where he can scare us or he can progress the film in a way that is, you know, shocking but satisfying. Have you mm-hmm. ever seen Open Water by chance? I have not. Um, that's a really good movie, and it's it's another similar one to this in the sense of. You know, though it's based on a true story where two people essentially got left behind. Um, Mm -hmm. Now, the outcome of it is still, in theory, um, something that's up for debate. But um, the consensus is that they're dead. Uh, Mm -hmm. They were either, you know, killed by the ocean or, you know, killed by sharks in that sense. Um, But that movie bases around the idea that they got left behind. Um, and now they're basically like bobbing at the surface of the water with their equipment. Mm-hmm. It has a very similar feel to that in that there's a point where they think, um, Kate and Lisa think that they the boat has left them. You can hear yeah. the engine kind of roaring away. So mm-hmm. it mixes it again with like, there's little sprinkles of hope when, again, they 
you know, they realize that they didn't actually leave them and they're coming back down. Um, and then also, um, you know, sprinkles of complete and utter despair, for instance, again, when they're bringing them up the second time and yet you've said it a little bit earlier, you know, the, the wire breaks again and now they're the top of, uh, you know, their thing is basically blocked in. Um, so there's just, there's always like a way basically where we can find like a little kind of, segment of hope i guess and then it's mm-hmm. washed away within a number of minutes that just uh, that again that excels this movie what was was there ever a moment where you actually thought that um they both weren't going to make it or that there was like completely no hope for them so i guess we'll just jump right to it then there's that fake out towards the end of the movie where um mandy moore's character believes that she's being rescued and they basically get onto the boat and she starts like looking at her hand, which she cuts open on the spear and it's bleeding, but the blood on her hand is like floating upwards. And so it's this very dreamlike thing that defies reality. And you're like, what is this all about? And then you realize, oh, she has, it's not the bends, but it's this idea that if you switch your oxygen tank and then you inhale too quickly or something like that, that it will make you, you get disoriented. And you kind of just like start dreaming and things like that. Or you have this uh, hallucinations. The film, I think, should have ended there. I think the movie should have ended with that shot of her on the ocean floor. Her leg is still trapped and she's like laughing to herself. I think the movie should have ended like it's a nastier ending. But I think it would have been much more memorable had it just been her sitting on the ocean floor and she's trapped down there and she's running out of air and they can't get to her or something like that. I like that idea. Cause then, you know, again, as it kind of pans away from her, like kind of sitting and laughing at her hand, cause she's on mm-hmm. stating um, captain Taylor um, and Matthew Modine did a phenomenal job of playing him. Um, yeah. but you can hear him, you know, trying to make some sort of a connection as it pans away. I think that would have been more satisfying, um, mm. but you know, that whole entire scene of her, you know, her sister getting attacked, um, which I, that's one of the, I feel really bad, but I, that was one of the dumbest deaths I've seen in like a shark movie. So yeah, I mean, that ending, I think it's a little too clean cut for me in the sense that I think it very much is a result of this being a PG-13 movie. Like in an R-rated movie, you could get away with kind of a nastier ending that doesn't really care for the audience's investment in certain characters. But when it's a PG-13 movie, I have a feeling that they want to appease to everybody and they don't want any sort of negativity surrounding the movie at all. So the idea that, oh yeah, it's this, these two girls get ravaged by sharks for 90 minutes and then the la- they both get killed. Like I have a feeling that might be a harder sell for a PG-13 audience. You're not wrong. <laughs> You're definitely not wrong. Um, I think I think it definitely would have been more satisfying had it ended um, with, I, I mean, I think if both of them died, that would have really been the most satisfying ending. But even with just the one of them surviving it, um, I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't think she's getting back together with her boyfriend then. Uh, no, I think that's a, that's a fair assumption to make. <laughs> it's going to be a no for me, dog. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but was there a moment when that whole situation was going down where you thought that this wasn't real? Like in terms of the hallucination, um, did you see any, I mean, cause you said that you met, you've seen this a couple of times. Did you see any kind of, um, any kind of hints or glimpses throughout that scene where you thought that this might not be real, that this is a, in fact, a hallucination. I mean, it's really just that moment where she has to trade the tanks out just because I think it would have been interesting too. If, if she's hallucinating, she wouldn't be hallucinating if she was actually dead. But this idea that she imagines herself getting rescued. And then in reality, like her tank is on E basically. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I just think that that type of ending would have complemented so much better his this idea that like there's no hope for you or no help that's coming if you're trapped on the what you perceive to be the bottom of the ocean floor like 47 meters down and in the end it doesn't really have anything to do with the sharks it's more this idea that the ocean is a inhospitable place for humans yeah. and so if you're if you're not careful if you're going to play these games and like hang out and uh, cages and go diving with sharks like 
that's the reality of what can happen to you. I mean, I will say this. I have swam with sharks before. Um, off the No, you haven't. You're a liar. I swear to God. I Once actually, ironically, in Mexico, I fed sharks in a cage. Um, okay. That's a, little di- that's, that's a little different. It was not like an aquarium type of it. Yeah, exactly. Okay. We're getting to the heart of it now. Yeah, but in Florida, I, I swam with some sh- I mean, they were nurse sharks. They're not going to bite my leg off. But like, <laughs> it was an electric eel that, that surfaced and we had to get out of there. Yeah. I, I, I'm just, the, the entire reason that I chose this movie was to actually tell you about that experience. And I feel a lot better for it now. All right. Well, you want to hear some facts about the movie that I found out through watching making of feature? Actually, yeah. Sure. So a majority of the movie was filmed in a tank. Hmm. It was not filmed 47 meters down anywhere. Uh, they did, they filmed in Puerto Rico, I believe um, oh. for a lot of the, scenes where they're on the beach and whatnot, like all the exterior shots of them dancing at the club and at the beach and looking out into the ocean, those types of things. But then everything revolving around the cage was filmed in a uh, tank on set basically. And uh, I think, I think they said like 90% of the movie takes place underwater, which I'm pretty sure is a first for a shark movie. Really? Yeah, I mean, you have movies like, what was the one that you mentioned? Open open water, but no, that's on top of the surface. Right, exactly. They're kind of like at the surface, and then they have that movie. Did you ever see that movie, The Shallow? Um, it's Shallows. A bad one that where like Jessica Alba's like on a rock, basically. Like, that Blake Lively. Blake Lively, sure. Um, one of the girls that Ryan Gosling dated. But yeah. um, uh, that's the one where she's like, again, like 30 feet away from the, the beach, and there's like a shark kind of yeah yeah unfortunately i have seen that one. Oh, i like that one but anyways it's one of those movies again where it's not taking place necessarily in the water for most of the movies otherwise that one in particular would be real short um so it's just interesting that this movie spends so much time underwater which again like you have to get creative with that it can't just be these two people floating underwater for an hour or whatnot because otherwise that would be pretty fucking boring uh, or they would just be dead real quick. So it was just interesting to see him take that and then really run with it. Um, and they said that they were doing, they did like a crash course on learning how to dive, but then they were in the water like eight hours a day for eight weeks or something insane like that. And it's just pretty crazy to think that you would have to spend that much time underwater. I don't, and not only just being underwater, cause you assume with a lot of movies that have scenes shot underwater, there's not a lot of talking or acting. There's a lot of movement, but there isn't a lot of like talking through lines and stuff, but they actually did have to do that. So I just think that that's kind of a cool, another layer that really, even if the dialogue is not always the best, like I think for the first 20 minutes, Mandy Moore just says like, are you coming back or something like that over and over? And it's just, it just kind of gives a little more credence to this idea that like, the dialogue isn't that great, but at the same time, it's impressive that they have to do this underwater work themselves and actually give these lines or what passes for lines. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think most of the budget went towards, you know, that aspect of the movie, not the writing clearly. Right. Um, but <laughs> you mentioned budget. This movie was only like five and a half million dollars to make. Oh, wow. And then it made 65, which is this is the one thing that never gets brought up or doesn't get brought up by people that aren't fans of horror movies in that you can say a lot of horror movies are really, or some people say horror movies are really, really bad. And yet even the worst reviewed movies, generally, if they don't have a crazy budget, like a Marvel movie or something, they at least double their money. And like this year um, they rebooted the grudge again and that a, a terrible move. I, couldn't stand it. I thought it was really bad. But that movie only cost, I think, five million or something like that to make. And it made like 30 or 40. And it's just this idea that, yeah, you, this might not be the best movie, but at the same time, like, it's real easy to make your money back if you cash in on certain things. And in this, I think this movie is like 10 times better than The Grudge. So I'm not trying to compare the two, but they do nail the elevator pitch of this really, really well. Like the shark CGI is fantastic. The underwater stuff is really, really well done and really well choreographed. And again, like we've, I've said it ad nauseum by now, but 
his weaponizing of the ocean and making the ocean a scary, it, the ocean is the monster, basically. His ability to do all of those things, I think, really allowed them to cash in on the things that people went to the movie to go see. And in that regard, like, it's not a surprise that it made all that money. Right. I mean, I think me and you need to sit down and start writing a script for a horror movie, if, if that's the case. Um, <laughs> get a pretty <laughs> Uh, but no, they make it look easy, huh? Did um, it, so I know that there's a sequel to this. Is mm -hmm. more in that? No, so it's completely. It's the same director who came back, but all new characters, all new cast. Um, I don't know if it takes place in Mexico. That might. I don't know if that is the continuing thread or not, but um, it definitely has sharks in it, and it definitely it has a new setting and a new environment, which. Not a lot of people were keen on. The second one, I definitely don't think is as good as the first one. But I think in terms of a sequel to a shark movie, which, I mean, how many times... Sequels already have enough not working in their favor to make them difficult to make. And the idea that you're going to do a shark sequel is just like, I don't really understand why you would think that would work. But in this, I think there's enough creativity that it distances itself from the original in not the best ways always, but in terms of just a premise, like it's not round two in the cage. They kind of swap out that metal traditional cage for an underground ruin, like uh, ancient civilization ruins that the new kind of crop of girls get lost and trapped in. Mm -hmm. So it's another cage, but it's not the same kind of premise or the same scenario as the first movie, which for me, I think I had a lot of fun with, mm -hmm. even if it's an inferior film in a lot of other regards. Well, I mean, the fact that it doesn't have Mandy Moore already, it's, it's well, yeah, I mean, um, but was there, you know, you have a pretty good, I think, uh, you know, kind of a library of, of knowledge on movies, obviously. Would you have chosen anybody else to play the role of Kate or Lisa, or did you feel that they did a pretty good job of selecting that cast? No, I think that they were, I think that they were fine. I mean, Again, I don't think the script or anything like that is a reason that I would ever suggest this movie. But at the same time, I feel like if you had bigger names or if you had more prominent actresses, there might be more of an incentive to include more dialogue, which then would kind of detract from what we actually want to get out of this movie. Like, this is the type of movie you go into and it's like, I want to see people get eaten by sharks and I want to be scared of the ocean. And it's like, they cashed in on both of those things and to deviate from those in terms of like trying to develop the characters of the story, which I just didn't care about. And it's not something that I was necessarily looking forward to with this movie or looking for in this movie. Then I think it's better to have these two actresses who are well known and perfectly fine, but they're not, it's not like a listers. Do you know what I mean? Right. Right. I mean, I actually that's a really good point yeah because if it would have been like if it would have been a more of a kind of a starlet I guess I mean not nothing against Mandy Moore but I don't know if she's necessarily an A-list actress at this point uh, right yeah you probably would have needed at least like another five or ten minutes of dialogue and I couldn't hear any more about the the boyfriend it, it's a different movie if it's Halle Berry and Jessica Alba at the bottom of the ocean you know what I mean like there's just more of an incentive to have them just have more, not screen time, but just have more of this dialogue back and forth. And what we got, the little bit that you do get during the movie, not to harp on it, but it just doesn't do anything for me. It's kind of just exactly what you would expect it to be. Um, well, I'll tell you this much. If there's a 49 meters down, a, a three core, cool whatever it's called, <laughs> and it has Halle Berry and Jessica Alba, whoever, whatever studio is making that, they have my 995. I mean, I would show up for it. I'm not saying I wouldn't show up for it, but it's this idea that, again, I just don't want anything to detract from what you go into these types of movies for. So it's kind of like why, I don't know, I guess I was going to use zombie movies as an example, but those are so character focused now that they made World War Z and that had Brad Pitt in it and you can't really get bigger than him. But this idea that you want to go into certain types of like creature features like this but you don't want to have an actor or an actress that is deviating a lot of attention from the reason that you're supposed to be 
there for the or why you showed up for that movie basically if you know what i mean no i agree man and um one of the you know kind of one of the last things that i i took away from this movie was um and i think you, you mentioned it earlier the the graphics on those sharks mm-hmm. they didn't see i mean obviously we understand that they're fake they're cgi but they look pretty darn good for cgi sharks especially in comparison to you know i don't want to I don't want to shit on Game of Thrones, but some of the stuff that we saw in season eight with their CGI effects were mm-hmm. not very realistic looking. Right. Um, not to necessarily compare dragons and sharks, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, they just, they looked very, very realistic. And especially for how big those sharks were. Uh, mm-hmm. Um, I, I think whoever did that cinematography or the, the CGI effects, I mean, they, they definitely got their money's worth for it. Yeah, that's a great point because we know that CGI can make or break movies or shows really, really easily and really quick. And on paper, this movie could have very easily been like a sci-fi channel Saturday night movie. It would just have really, really shitty CGI. And the fact that this movie was given the attention to detail and making sure that CGI was as pristine as it was, it's probably also indicative actually of why it had such a limited budget. Like the budget itself they're in a tank and they did some exterior shoots in uh, a foreign country. So they weren't crazy expensive to begin with. And so they probably had extra money in the budget for those CGI effects and whatnot, which I mean, that was really incredible planning because the CGI sharks, like you said, are tremendous. Like no point do they kind of come off as being fake or just CGI that hasn't aged well. Let's put it that way. Um, And I was surprised to learn that they didn't use, like usually when they do CGI, they'll use something to represent what they're going to eventually put on screen. So um, I was talking to one of our friends, uh, Alex, about Annihilation a couple of episodes back and they did CGI touch-ups for everything, but they still, in one scene, there's an alligator and they still made like a plastic mold of the alligator to capture its body movements. But then they did CGI over it, obviously. But in this, it was all CGI. So I would really be interested to learn how they were able to capture the way that the sharks move because that looks, it looks like a, like Nat Geo. Yeah. It, it was very, very realistic. And, um, you know, I mean, I think there were certain Jaws movies, for instance, where it looked very fake and it took away from, I guess the, the horror of the actual concept. Um, so the fact that they were able to do this in such a, a productive way, again, I mean, I think hats off to, to Joe Honest and, uh, you know, kind of the crew for doing that. And, you know, man, I, you know, I, I always say this to you every time we talk, I, I really love everything that you're doing and I, I can't thank you enough for having me back on this. It's a, it's a pleasure to listen to these and, you know, be a part of these whenever I can be. Well, thanks, man. I appreciate you always being willing to come on and, picking awesome movies for us to talk about. Cause it's great to, to talk with somebody like we, I was doing a little bit of like bullshitty nitpicking earlier, but at the same time, like we're able to have a conversation and try to highlight the things that we appreciate more than kind of just tearing apart every little thing in a movie. And not everybody is down to have conversations like that. So sometimes I'm sort of picking and choosing who I'm having on. Cause it's like, yeah, we can talk about certain things that we didn't like, but at the same time, like, okay, are we really going to spend 15 minutes tearing apart this one little thing? You know what I mean? So yeah, no, I appreciate, I, as much as you appreciate being on, I appreciate you coming on to chat. Um, but I'm excited to tackle the sequel because you haven't seen it, correct? I have not, no. It's- okay, so 47 Meters Down uh, Uncaged is streaming on Amazon Prime. Um, and I've only seen it once, but I'm excited to check it out again and see if the little bits that I enjoyed the first time hold up because... I've talked to a couple of friends about it um, in preparation for this and they were saying I would not watch that again. So I'm interested to see what you think. Oh, it's, it's going to be, it's, it's definitely going to be interesting to to take a look at it. And I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to being back on here soon, buddy. Thanks for listening to another episode of the daily horror habit podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to daily horror habit on your preferred streaming service and follow at daily horror habit on Instagram or at daily horror pod on Twitter.